Well, good morning, church. Thank you. That might have been my kid. I'm not sure. Oh, my gosh. This is the first and last time that they are sitting in service to hear me preach. So, so that's fun. We all get to share in that together. Uh, my name is Tom Butler, and I have the privilege of serving here at Richwoods as the executive pastor. And if you were here on Mother's Day and had a family picture taken out in the commons, uh, you might remember me from your camera roll. Maybe you had a picture that looked a little something like this. Uh, that day I styled my hair by sticking a fork in an electrical socket, uh, but you know, uh, Pastor Chad reminded me that here we walk unashamed, and so boldly, I walk unashamed. Uh, I am privileged for the opportunity uh, to get to uh, share God's word with us today. Uh, I'm glad that we're able to be together, especially on this holiday weekend, here together in this room. If you're online, we're really glad that you're with us, uh, but it's important for us to gather together, and my hope is that by the end of today... No matter how separated from God you may feel that you are, I hope that you know that you are never too far for him to restore you or to use you for amazing things. And so, I would also like to begin by wishing everyone a happy Pentecost. And when someone says happy Pentecost, you say, yeah, I don't know, it's not really a thing. I was just curious if anybody would shout something out there. Um, but yeah, today is Pentecost. Um, for those of us who are wearing red, accidentally, we're doing it. All right, Pentecost, people traditionally wear red on Pentecost. That's fun. Uh, Pentecost is a holiday that follows 50 days after Passover. In fact, Pentecost is just the Greek word for 50. It's not super creative, but it's okay. And so we find Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And we see two very special, very important things that happen at Pentecost. And we'll look at those together here in a few minutes. But before we get to that, I want to go back in time from Pentecost, 50 days back to Passover, and recap all of the things that happened from Passover to Pentecost. Passover, you may remember. Jesus and the disciples in the upper room. They break bread. Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. Jesus washes his disciples' feet and predicts the betrayal of Judas. From there, they get up and they walk to the Garden of Gethsemane, where they go and spend time in prayer. And Jesus prays fervently, has to keep waking his disciples up to pray with him, to match him. He prays so hard, it says, if blood is pouring down his head. While they're there in the garden, at about 2 a.m., a mob comes and shows up there, and they, it's, there's Roman soldiers, there's people, they're sent by the Jewish leaders, and the person at the front of the mob leading them there is Judas. They had been to this garden many times, they had prayed there before, Judas knew where they would be, and he led this mob there, and he walked up, and he kissed Jesus on the cheek as a sign of betrayal so that the people would know who to arrest. And then it's super shady, These the middle of the night mob coming, and Jesus calls them out. He says, like, am I leading a rebellion that you come in the middle of the night with swords and clubs and torches? I've been in a temple court preaching every single day, but you come in the middle of the night to arrest me. And he's right. It's the beginning of something that's pretty shady. So they arrest him. They take him to the high priest Caiaphas' house. And they have to wait until 6 a.m. because that's what time basically business opens. And they wanted to be first in line to get Jesus in front of Pontius Pilate. He's the Roman governor of that area. And at that time, only the Roman governor had the ability to hand down a death sentence. And that's what the Jewish leaders are looking for from Jesus. And so they wait there in the courtyard for, uh, for a few hours. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then at uh, about 6 a.m., business opens, and they bring Jesus in front of Pontius Pilate. Uh, Pilate knows 
that Jesus is innocent. He doesn't want anything to do with this. And once he learns that Jesus is actually a Galilean, and he knows that Herod is in town, Herod is the guy who has authority over Galilee, Pilate sends him off to Herod. Herod interviews him, doesn't want any part of it, sends him back to Pilate. Pilate knows Jesus did nothing wrong, is trying to find a way to distance himself from it. He offers them, like, hey, every at this time, every year, we let one person go free. Would you rather let Jesus go free or Barabbas, who's murdered people? And they say, give us Barabbas. And eventually Pilate is frustrated. He, he feels trapped. He gives in to political pressure, and he literally washes his hands to say, my hands are clean of Jesus' blood. It's on you. And so then at about 9 a.m., just a few hours since the arrest, we see Jesus on a cross, crucified. At around noon, the sky goes dark. And around 3 p.m., Jesus breathes his last, gives up his spirit, says his last words, and dies. And by 6 p.m., he's in the tomb, less than 12 hours from when we began, less than 24 hours since we began with Passover. Saturday comes and goes, and then we find ourselves on what we now know as Easter. When the people went to the tomb to prepare Jesus' body, they found the stone rolled away. The guards are gone, and there's an angel saying, he's gone. He's risen. He's back. And so that begins, uh, and by the way, that on Easter, that's the Jesus' resurrection. That's, uh, Scripture says, the reason for the hope that we have. If that didn't happen, then Paul writes, our, our hope is meaningless. This is all meaningless if that's not true, if Jesus didn't conquer death. But it is true and it happened. And so because of that, we have hope. And so that began a 40-day period where Jesus appears to his uh, disciples and other people, at least over 10 different occurrences. He appears to over 500 people and uh, teaches and, and does demonstrations. And then 40 days after Easter, we, have, we find Jesus on the hill ready to, uh, to ascend. He gives his disciples what we call the Great Commission. He says, the Holy Spirit is going to descend upon you. And then you are going uh, to, to share the good news here in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then Jesus ascends into heaven. And that begins a seven-day period where the disciples are holed up and they're praying and they're worshiping and they're discerning and they're preparing for what's coming next. And then we find ourselves 50 days from Passover. We finally arrived at Pentecost. So here on Pentecost, we find 120 of Jesus' followers in a room, and they're praying, and they're preparing, and something amazing happens. And we're going to talk about that here in just a moment. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to go back to something I glossed over all the way back here on Passover night, and I want to tell you about one of my favorite Bible characters, a guy named Peter. So Peter, he had this incredible run of things. Peter was a fisherman of Galilee, and that is not something that you wanted to be. A fisherman in Galilee is something you ended up doing. It's what you did to put food on the table and to pay rent, and maybe if your father and his father before him and your son after you are all fishermen, then maybe that's it. But otherwise, it's not a glamorous thing. You work hard, long hours, sunburns, you smell like fish, you're sore from manual labor, so when Jesus comes along and offers Peter the chance to follow him, Peter jumps at the chance. Uh, it's, a, it's an opportunity to be reputable, to not do hard manual labor. But even more than that, there's something about Jesus that was compelling, something that compelled Peter to say, yes, I want to follow you. And so over the next three years, Peter becomes so much more than just a fisherman. He becomes one of the 12 disciples, one of the apostles, and one of Jesus' closest friends and confidants. In fact, Jesus tells Peter that he, above all others, will be the rock upon which Jesus builds his church. Now, it's hard not to love Peter. Like I said, he's one of my favorite Bible characters. Uh, for, for better or for worse, I feel like I might closely resemble Peter for some of his... Uh, over-exuberant enthusiasm. 
Uh, you know, Peter, he's, he's well-meaning. Uh, he's, he's supportive, he's enthusiastic, but he can also be a little bit awkward. You know, maybe, maybe you know people like that. He's just a little bit extra. So I'll give you some examples. In Matthew 14, there's a storm uh, when they're out on the boat in Galilee, and Jesus comes walking across the water to them. This is a miracle, Jesus walking on water. And Peter says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to you. And he gets out of the boat and starts walking on the water to Jesus. But then he gets distracted by the storm and the waves, and he loses sight of Jesus. He begins to doubt, and he begins to sink. And Jesus has to come and, and help him get back to the boat. In Matthew 17, at the transfiguration on the mountain, Peter says, oh, my gosh, this is so good. We should stay here. I'm going to build us houses. We're just going to live here on the side of the mountain and stay here for forever. And Jesus is like, no, that's... Thanks, Peter, but no, that's not what we're doing. At Passover, when Jesus comes and washes the disciples' feet, Jesus says, or Peter says, no, Jesus, like, you, you can't wash my feet. I won't allow you to degrade yourself to do something as demeaning as washing my feet. But then when Jesus says, hey, if I can't wash your feet, you can have no part of me. Peter says, like, starts taking off his shirt and says, well, then wash my whole body. That's not exactly what happened. He says, well, then wash my my hands and my head also, but, you know, I kind of like that idea of him just being so over the top, he just starts stripping off his robe. Later that same night, uh, on the way to the garden, P Jesus tells Peter that that very night, by the time the rooster crows in the morning, Peter would deny him three times, and Peter says, no way. Even if all of these others, and I imagine there's the disciples walking together, he says, even if all of these others fall away, I will never forsake you. Ironically, Peter denies Jesus' prediction of him denying Jesus. So, I don't know. No one appreciates that, but that's fine. They didn't last service anyway either, but I like it. Uh, eventually, we see Peter martyred for his faith uh, by the emperor Nero. But Peter chooses not to be martyred in the same way that Jesus was killed. And so, he chose to be crucified upside down because he didn't think himself worthy of the same death as Jesus. And so, Peter, he's a little bit extra, but it's really hard not to love him. And so, Peter's very close to Jesus, which is what makes what happens next so hard to witness. So, on Passover night, when Jesus was arrested by the mob, they took him to the house of the high priest Caiaphas. And so uh, they're in this courtyard, and Jesus is under armed guard over here, and there's people kind of milling about, and it's cold, and so they, someone starts a fire, and people huddle around the fire to keep warm. It's about 3 a.m., and they've got to wait about three hours until 6 a.m. And so as they were sitting there around the fire, a servant girl saw Peter and said, this man was with Jesus. But Peter denied it. He said, woman, I don't know him. Later, about maybe an hour goes by, later someone else, saw, uh, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Notice the word also. You also are one of them. Who else have they been finding? Have they been highlighting? And what's happening to them? Have they, maybe they've been taken, arrested, beaten. We don't know. I don't want to lose the stakes of this night. These are high stakes, and Peter has reason to be afraid. And so the man says, you also are one of them. But Peter replied, man, I am not. And another hour goes by, and it's almost daybreak, and someone else says, surely this man was with Jesus because he also is a Galilean. And Peter relied on the colorful language he learned as a young fisherman. With very strong language, he says, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And as those very words are leaving his mouth, a rooster crows. And in that moment, Peter realizes what he's just done. And he turns and looks at Jesus. And John says, Jesus turned and looked at Peter. And I imagine their eyes met and Peter realized what he had just done. The words Jesus spoke just a few hours before that you would deny me three times by the, by the moment the rooster crows come flooding back. 
and Peter is ruined. Scripture says he goes outside and he weeps bitterly. He runs from Jerusalem with the echo of the denial of his friend and his rabbi and his Messiah echoing in his head. The next time we see Peter, several days have gone by. He's back in his hometown on the Sea of Galilee, back on his fishing boat. And you know he was mocked when he came back. Hey, Peter, what happened? thought you were too good for fishing boats. Hey, Peter, what happened to Jesus? But they knew what happened to Jesus. He was the follower of a failed rabbi, and Peter quickly began to smell of fish again, and he became sore and weary from hard labor hauling nets. So consider this slide. Peter is actually worse off than he was before. See, when he began, he could have just been a dude. He could have just been a fisherman on Galilee who went fishing with the team, who came back and drank beer with the guys, spent time with his wife, threw bags on the weekend. You know, he's probably someone that we would enjoy hanging out with. But because he took a chance because he answered the call that Jesus had invited him to and because the man that he pledged himself to was arrested and killed and he returns home in shame, Peter is worse off than as if he had just stayed there the whole time. So Peter did wrong. He denied Jesus. He sinned. And because of his shame, Excuse me. Because of his sin, Peter carries shame and bitterness. Because of his sin, Peter felt separated from God. And because of our sin, we too can feel separated from God. You know, usually we know when we're doing something wrong. And maybe right now, if I paused just long enough, some of the personal vices that you carry, the things that you do maybe when no one is watching or the things that you know are wrong but you still do them anyway might come to your mind. And unfortunately, we all have them. Sometimes we're unaware of them, but usually we know. But we end up choosing the wrong thing because it's enticing to us or we have a moment of weakness or are vulnerable. Sometimes maybe it feels comfortable to return to our sin because at least it's, it's comfortable, it's known. We know what to expect or we chose that rather than having to hope and rely on, on mercy or grace, which we don't deserve. Or maybe we're missing something. We're trying to fill an emptiness inside of us. Maybe you felt an emptiness or a hopelessness, or a restlessness, that something is missing. And we try to fill it with all kinds of things, alcohol, drugs, uh, sex, relationships, food, social media, your career. The list goes on and on. We can name things all day long that we try to find meaning in. But what we end up chasing is a horizon. The closer we get, the more it recedes. We can never reach it. It's an illusion, and it's empty. Because the reality is that thing that we're looking for, that thing that we're chasing, that we're trying to fill, is Jesus. We call that the God-shaped hole in our lives. The emptiness that we experience is separation from God, and Jesus is the only way to fill the void. That's the only thing that brings that completion. And so because of our sin, we too can feel shame and separation and bitterness and distance from God. Maybe you felt too broken to be put back together or maybe so messy that you know God would never want to use you. So I want to pause here for a second because I think something that if, you're, if you've been a Christian for a while, we can lose the magnificence of what we're talking about right now, the significance, the, the miracle of grace, that we can, it can become, okay, I've heard this before, sinner, grace, Jesus. Don't let that happen. Listen with fresh ears. Look inside your heart. Find 
uh, find what God is trying to break through to you today. Because I do believe he has a fresh message, something that the Spirit wants to share with you. Because we have hope. That song we just sang, I love it. We have hope. In a moment, we're going to see that Jesus restored Peter from his fall from grace. And if he can restore Peter, who walked with Jesus, who was Jesus' close friend, and he betrayed him, then certainly he can restore us too. And so, one morning, Peter is out with uh, six other disciples on a fishing boat. And uh, a guy out on the beach calls out to him and says, Hey, have you guys caught anything? If you are a fisherman like me, you know the sting of not catching fish and how frustrating it is to tell that person, No, we haven't caught anything. But that's what they have to answer back with. No, we haven't caught anything. And the guy on the beach says, try the other side of the boat. Okay. They throw the net on the other side, and immediately the net is full. They catch 153 fish. They counted. And uh, they, it's so, the net's so full, they can't bring it into the boat. And John, who's on the boat, realizes, he says, it's the Lord. And the words are no sooner out of John's mouth than Peter does a very Peter thing. He dives over the edge of the ship and begins swimming towards Jesus as fast as he can. And in so doing, leaving the other guys to bring the fish on the boat in by themselves. Like I said, Peter can sometimes be hard to love. But eventually they gather together on the beach and they find that Jesus has built a small wood fire and he's uh, roasted fish and cooked bread, and he invites them to sit down and share breakfast together. So after they had eaten, Jesus said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. A second time, Jesus asks Peter if he loves him. And a second time, Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then a third time, Jesus asks Peter if he loves him, and Peter is cut to the heart. I imagine in that moment, the third ask reminds Peter of a different wood campfire that he'd been at not that long ago in the courtyard when three times he was asked about Jesus and three times he said no. I think Peter's probably filled with conviction and maybe shame. Maybe back then he hoped that Jesus didn't know, but I think Peter knew that Jesus knew. And so here, when Jesus, around this campfire, says for the third time, do you love me? Peter knows that he knows, and he's crushed. And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then we see Jesus reinstate Peter, restore him to where he was. He charges Peter with feeding his sheep, with caring for his people. And at that moment, we see Peter being fully restored. He's forgiven. And with Jesus, forgiven means forgiven. Maybe you know someone where forgiven doesn't mean forgiven. Forgiven comes with baggage and asterisks. But with Jesus, that's not the way. There's no lingering guilt or shame. Jesus isn't holding something over Peter's head. In Psalm 103, the psalmist tells us that God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve because our sins do deserve justice. But God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve, but as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. And in this grace that Jesus shows Peter, we see the rest of Peter's ark. Remember that low, low that Peter hit when he came back to his hometown? That wasn't the end of his story. God wasn't done with him yet. See, Peter's story didn't end when he returned to Galilee. But, uh, Jesus forgave him and restored him. In a moment, from that low, low, uh, Peter led to new high highs. Well, we're going to see in a moment that God had incredible plans for Peter, for what he's going to do for him. Incredible plans for Peter's future. Incredible ways that God is going to restore and then use Peter to do amazing things for the kingdom. And in the same way, that Jesus extended grace and forgiveness to Peter. He offers the same opportunity for forgiveness and restoration to us as well. And so, Scripture is full of this good news for us. 
It places our sin in juxtaposition, in tension against uh, the good news of grace and mercy. Because our God is a God of justice, and our sins demand justice. But the justice that is uh, owed us is surpassed by the mercy that is shown us, as God's grace is enough to more than cover the sins uh, that we've incurred. So consider this verse, uh, Romans 6.23. It says, for the wages of sin is death. A wage. A wage is something you earn. If you've earned a wage, it's deserved, uh, it's owed to you. And so what sin earns us, owes us, is spiritual death. But, and in Greek, this is a significant but. I can't say that without it sounding funny, but like it's a pivot, it's a hinge. Um, it says, for the, sin, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's amazing news. We deserve spiritual death, but the gift of God for us is eternal life in Jesus. In Romans 3, earlier in that, in that same book, Paul writes, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And because Jesus redeemed us through his actions on the cross, we no longer live in shame or under fear of condemnation. Romans 8, Paul writes, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, God did by ascending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So we see that the redemption that God offered Peter is also extended to us. And earlier I promised I'd tell you about what happened at Pentecost, but we wanted to understand what had just happened in some of Peter's backstory. And so now that we know about the arc of Peter, of the the rise and and the, the fall and the redemption, Now, I want to revisit Pentecost. And we're going to see that here at Pentecost, God had really big plans for Peter. And we can trust that God has really big plans for us too. Don't be afraid to make that personal. God has really big plans for you too. So on Pentecost morning, 50 days since Passover, and think about how much has happened in those 50 days. On Pentecost morning, there's about 120 people gathered together, not unlike us today. And so the story picks up in Acts chapter 2, and I actually want to invite you uh, to close your eyes. I'm going to describe what happens. I'm going to read the scripture to you. I don't have it up on a slide on purpose. Um, There's a term, tongues of fire. If you don't know what that is, you can imagine uh, the flame that sits on top of a candle as, as a tongue of fire. And so... Imagine a crowded house in the Middle East. There's 120 people there. I don't care how big the house is. 120 people is a lot of people crammed into a house. The air condition is broken. Just kidding. There was no air condition back then. It probably smells bad. The day promises to be hot, but maybe the coolness of the morning is still baking off. Maybe every once in a while, the reprieve of a breeze blows through the open windows but it's probably beginning to get a bit stuffy in there. And the disciples, 120, are gathered together, praying and worshiping and discerning. And suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. 
Imagine what that sounded like. Somehow, all these different languages being spoken, and yet you can understand what they're saying in your language. So now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. We'll see eventually this crowd numbers in the thousands because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, as you know, imagine this crowd around this house. It says, aren't all these people who are speaking Galileans? It was a bit of an insult because Galileans were kind of looked down on. Say, then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? And then Luke, the author of Acts, goes on to list 16 different languages from all across the known world that are present in that space at that moment that are hearing the glory of God being proclaimed in their own language. And they ask, how is it we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues? Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? If you still have your eyes closed, thank you for playing along. You can open them. So I like to imagine what that might have been like, a crowd in the thousands around the space with the wind and, and, the, and the strange words. And they ask a great question. They say, what does this mean? Well, what we see right here is a turning point for the spiritual state of humanity. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised when he ascended to heaven, now has arrived. And it's unleashed in and on and through God's people. But then notice what happens next. Someone in the crowd, if something amazing spiritually is happening, like this is unprecedented, and people are responding, their hearts are being moved, and someone from the back yells out, they just had too much wine. Be prepared for that, by the way. When God's doing something in you, when you're taking steps towards him, when you're experiencing uh, progress, when you're growing deeper in your personal relationship with Jesus, when you're establishing the habits and practices that help you spend time with him, be prepared for mockery and uh, things that may come up to try to derail you. So don't be surprised by it. Prepare for it. Welcome it because it's a reminder that you're on the right track. And I love how Peter responds to that guy who shouted out, they've had too much wine. He says, these people aren't drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. It's only nine in the morning. That's good enough for me, I guess, for them. That was evidence. But he goes on. He says, it's only nine in the morning. They're not drunk. He says, what's happening right here was prophesied about by the prophet Joel. And then he goes on to fill them in on everything that is happening. And so I'm going to share Peter's words with you now. This is Peter's sermon. He says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch, David, he died and was buried, and his tomb is still here to this day. But he was also a prophet, and he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And in that moment, Peter, 
the disgraced fisherman who was restored by Jesus, gave the very first recorded sermon of the resurrected Jesus. And the response, over 3,000 people responded to his sermon, to his preaching, and came to faith on that day. And that's the moment that we consider the birth of the church. And in that moment, we see fulfilled Jesus' declaration that Peter would be the rock on which he builds his church. And so, God used Peter to launch a movement and to change the world, and he wants to use us too. Now, there's lots of ways God wants to use us to change the world. There's lots of ways that he could do that. There's some big macro picture things. We can look at the world and see that things are wrong. War, famine, slavery, systemic thing. Like, we can, we can make a list. And we can feel called to intervene in that, to make a difference through uh, non-governmental organizations or nonprofits or getting engaged in politics and trying to right those wrongs on a big picture scale. We can also choose the micro. We can begin making a difference uh, one person at a time, one conversation, one act of kindness, one act of generosity. I'll be honest, for me, the, the bigness of the problem can feel overwhelming to me, but I know that I can make a difference in one person's life, and that's how I choose to try to engage and try to make the world a better place. There's lots of great ways to do it. And the Bible gives us lots of great examples, too. Uh, The sick, the poor, the incarcerated, widows, orphans, um, people who need clothing, people who are oppressed. Uh, The list goes on and on. There's lots of things that we can do. But maybe that feels like too much. There's, there's There's too many things to do. It can feel overwhelming. It would be nice if Jesus had just given us a summary, like, boil it down for me, Jesus. Make it simple. I've got good news for you. I'm glad you asked. In Matthew 22, a Pharisee who is an expert in the law, think Supreme Court justice, like a big deal. He goes to trick Jesus and trap him by testing him with this question. He says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all your soul and all your heart and all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So Jesus makes it real simple for him and for us. All of the law and the prophets can be summarized by these four words. Love God, love others. And that's it. It's all summarized right there, and we can make it more complicated. We can dig in, and well, what does that mean? What exactly? When isn't it loving? When is it loving? We can make it more complicated, but also we can recognize that it doesn't need to be more complicated than that. It can be that simple. Love God and love others. And ultimately, that's how God wants us to change the world. Like he did with Peter, he also wants to do in us. And so speaking of Peter, as we see his ark, God's redemption of him, that he felt separated from God. I want to remind us all that no matter how separated from God you may feel, you are never too far from God for him to be able to restore you or to use you to do incredible things. And so, if he can do that for Peter, he can certainly do it for us. But I don't want to be rhetorical. I don't want to just ask a rhetorical question and and leave it there. I want to get specific. I want to ask, like, now what? Now what do we do? How do we respond to that? Well, I'm glad you asked. I think I'm funny. It's fine. Um, See, actually, at Pentecost, the crowd asked that exact question. They heard the gospel that Peter presented, and they said, like, it says they were cut to the heart And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
And so God has made it easy to respond to him. And so here are three specific things you can do. First, I want to invite you, if you haven't, to say yes to God. Preceding action is acceptance. If you don't accept it, you're just changing your behavior. That's not the point. Allow yourself to believe that what is true is true. And this can be scary because maybe you've worn your disbelief like a shield. Maybe you've worn it so long, your disbelief has become an identity. And for you to let your guard down and consider the idea that this is true would strip you naked, would open you to criticism like Peter going home. Or maybe there's something else that holds you back, shame or pride or other baggage that you're choosing to carry. Uh, a while back, Pastor Chad did this sermon. He had a big door right here, do you remember? And, and had these bags. We talked about how Jesus wants us to set our baggage down and walk through the door. But oftentimes, we refuse to set it down. We refuse to let it go. And so, if that's you today, whatever it is you're holding on to, I invite you to set it down. Because God's not asking you to do that. And Jesus wants you to respond to him and say yes. When we are confronted with this amazing grace of Jesus, the love that he shows us, we're compelled to respond in kind. And so, consider saying yes. A second thing, and maybe this hits someone in a different way, is to repent. Now, repent can mean a few things, but one of the things it means is to turn. It says you're on this one path, you're going this one way, and you repent of it, you turn, and you begin going in another. So to repent means to turn, to turn from something and to turn toward something. Now, I have a fun visual that I want to share with you that you might be nostalgic for some of us. Does anybody remember Super Mario 64? A couple of people, all right. Uh, in Super Mario 64, on the Nintendo 64 gaming system, released summer of 1996, as we all know, if you had 70 stars earned, you could run up the staircase and into the space and just continue on with the game. But if you didn't have 70 stars, you found yourself on the infinite staircase. You would run and run and run and run, and you would never make progress. You would never get to the next area. But when you stopped and turned around, something cool happened that I think is a really neat metaphor uh, for repentance. I want to share it with you. And so as Mario runs, is an analog for us. We can run from God as long as you'd like to. You can sin as much as you feel you need to. You can pile sin and shame as high as you feel that you need to. You can fixate on all the vile things that you've done and make a long list of why you're not good enough. Or you can convince yourself that God would never want to do anything with you, not after what you've done or after maybe what's been done to you. And you could believe the lies that are being told to you and let them keep you from God. And you can just keep running and running and running. But it gets tiring. And you know that there's nothing ahead for you on that path. And so eventually, I hope you repent. I hope you turn from something to God. And you might find something like this. You might find that when you turn, the God that you've been running from, the God who's allowed you to run, the God who has loved you the entire time that you are running from him, when you turn, you find that God is right there waiting for you, ready to receive you with open arms. And we can feel shame or guilt. I want to remind you of that verse from earlier in Romans 8. There is no shame or condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Nothing is held against you. All you have to do is turn. And when you turn, allow yourself to believe the good news that is absolutely true, that God is there waiting for you, eagerly hoping that you turn to him, and he's so glad that you've come back to him. And I want you to know that all those reasons that we build up in our mind of why we're not good enough, why God couldn't want us, why maybe we're too far from grace for Jesus to want us, 
Those are all lies of the devil designed to keep us from God. Don't let that work. Okay, so we can say yes. We can repent and turn from something to something. Repent, turn from sin, turn to God. And third, we can follow. We can take a step of obedience towards God. And there's lots of ways that we can do this. And for some of you, maybe what we already talked about, maybe saying yes, maybe allowing yourself to believe is that. And so if you haven't submitted to Jesus' lordship in your life, you haven't asked him to be your savior, maybe today is the day. If you want help with that, find a pastor. There's people down here after every service who love to pray with people. If there's anything you can want to be prayed for, people love to do that down here. We'd love to help you with that. If you haven't been baptized yet, I mean, that's what Peter said in Acts 2, repent and be baptized. Maybe that's the next step in faith for you as you respond to Jesus. If you're not being discipled, let us know. Discipleship is something big we do here called the journey of discipleship. We'd love to help you get paired up with someone. The two of you grow in your faith together. If you're open to that, we'd love to help you with that. If you aren't giving, maybe begin that by giving something. And as we give, uh, it's an act of obedience, but also gratitude. And also, we begin to practice uh, uh, relying on God to meet our needs as we stop trusting ourselves and begin trusting him. So there's lots of ways that we can begin submitting to Jesus' lordship over our lives. These are just a few of them. And wherever you are on that, whatever you're considering, I just want this to land big for you. I want you to remember that no matter how separated from God you may feel that you are, you are never too far for him to restore you and to use you for great things. So say yes. Turn to Jesus and follow him. And hey, happy Pentecost, everybody. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you for what you did for us all those years ago giving us your spirit to lead us and guide us. And we eagerly uh, await for, for your return. In the meantime, God, use us. Help us to redeem this world, to, to do great things, to point people back to you, to help them experience and know your love. And we do love you, Jesus. Thank you. And it's your name that we pray. Amen. Please join us by standing, singing.